Hello. This week's uh, Distance DevOps Lunch and Learn was remarkable discussion about uh, cloud hardware, hardware performance, and getting the best deal out of the cloud and understanding what's going on behind the scenes. So Paul Teich led us through a great discussion. Um, as always, discussion is moved up. Uh, we actually talked about this topic before the discussion too. So hang around and, and listen to our discussion because we actually go into Linux and a whole bunch of Linux ARM type information and, and that's at the end. So hang out for that. It's really good. See you soon. I, all right, I'm, I'm gonna open up. There's a ton of questions I have following, but since we're already uh, rolling with, <laughs> with the topic and I, I'm eager to get into it anyway and we're, we're at the time. Um, I, Paul, uh, Paul, I'll let you, you run your own introduction mostly, um, but I do wanna say, I'm gonna hand it over to you to talk about cloud performance um, and, and explain it. And for people who are jumping where I make this the beginning of the video, um, we started talking about this 10 minutes ago, so check out, the, I'll, I'll put that at the end. So, Paul, give some background on you on Lifter and, and and this topic that I think we'll all find really cool. Um, so I have um, say a decade as a software developer doing firmware. I have two decades with AMD. Um, each decade separated by three years of irrational exuberance, where I, I actually spent seven million dollars of Polaris and G fifty one capital um, doing what looked like Evernote, but before smartphones, so it died. Mm -hmm. And I went back to AMD and started up Opteron. So I was on the Opteron startup team um, two thousand two. We did AMD in the data center. That was my introduction to all of this, you know, enterprise reliability stuff. Um, and then uh, about uh, about eight years ago, I left AMD um, to become an industry analyst. Worked with Pat Moorhead for a while, and then with uh, Jim and Kevin over at Tyrius Research. And about two years ago, some folks who were at the time doing cloud brokerage uh, found me and said, hey, we're gathering telemetry on public clouds. That's public telemetry. Uh, Want to see if we can do something with this as a business. And that became Lifter Insights. So we spun out um, about a year ago. And uh, Lifter Insights tracks today the top four clouds. Um, and when I say track, we enumerate um, their IaaS service offerings worldwide through their developer APIs. So we know where every configuration is on the planet for AWS, Azure, Google Cloud Platform, and Alibaba Cloud. Um, where we're currently adding uh, another one or two of those. Uh, those, the four we track now account for about two thirds of IaaS revenue. Um, so we know where the processors are, where the cores are, how fast the cores are running, uh, how many cores per instance type, what the gigabytes per core profile and total memory per configuration looks like. And we do this every month because we're DevOps. Um, so unlike a lot of the, uh, you know, survey based folks measuring market, um, we do this monthly and that allows us to track at a very granular level what's new. So we can, we can see all the new instance types each month. We actually see some old ones get deleted. Um, we know that when the prices get delisted, um, so far there's only one region that's delisted. We've been doing this since, um, March uh, 2019, um, and so uh, AWS, sorry, Azure took out a Gov region uh, in April, and that was the only region we've seen deleted, but we do see old types get deleted, like there are still some Opterons in the market, believe it or not. Um, Alibaba's got some old Fire Pro, we know a lot about GPUs and accelerators, um, and so we're pretty sure they brought them from crypto miners out in Asia. <laughs> okay, so, um, but we see all this stuff pop up um, and we track the announcements. And what we've been doing is kind of a share of shelf. And so because we know month to month what changes in these large IaaS deployments, um, we can measure AMD's share of shelf space. So we don't know how many actual physical servers are deployed. We know what's available to rent in each region and what the price is. And we look at Linux on-demand pricing as our baseline, but we see, we see, and that's in-house Linux. 
to be clear, mostly Ubuntu based, right? So but we also see the SUSE, the Red Hat deployments. We see Windows, you know, Windows Server deployments uh, and their pricing. We do some work there. Um, and um, that's kind of the background in, in terms of the data set we gather. Uh, we're aiming now, we're doing some prototyping on um, performance. And this isn't, it, so the biggest question we get is, you know, AWS sells AM, rents AMD based instance types at a discount to their Intel based dis instance types. Is, is that a good deal? And so we're trying to answer the question of value. Okay, so given a general purpose workload, um, what can we do? Now we can set up different workload profiles. So this is gonna be the performance part of it um, where I'll, I'll kind of set the stage. Um, there's so many vectors of performance, <laughs> okay? So uh, within a cloud, we're looking at um, does performance scale from 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 96 cores per image? Does it scale with memory? Okay, as, as memory scales from 2, 4, 8, 16, a lot of instance types don't go really much past 8, but, but there are some that go way off the deep end in terms of the amount of memory per core offered with a large amount of cores. There's some terabyte uh, memory spaces out there. But does performance scale within the memory, if you keep memory per core constant and number of cores, you know, or vary memory per core with constant number of cores, how does that affect performance? Because that also affects price. So number of cores, uh, gigabytes per core. Um, then you get into what generation of infrastructure in the cloud. So am I looking at Nitro or not in AWS? Um, and, and there's still some old types that don't have Nitro. Am I looking at Nitro Accelerated, the N types? There's a little N at the end of the uh, instance type name, uh, C5N, C5DN. Um, and that's, that's like four times the network bandwidth of stock nitro, right? And so how does that affect performance and price? Then you get into the processors. And so am I looking at an M, M5A or an M5? M5A is the AMD variant. M5 is the Intel Xeon variant. Uh, and now I have M5G for Graviton, okay? <laughs> and so, and so I'm, now I'm comparing a similar core count and memory per core footprint across processor architectures, okay? Um, and then now I have to determine what region they're all available in. And I know that, okay? Because I know which regions they're available in worldwide. And is there a difference in performance in a given region? Um, and then... Then this we start. This is a combinatorial matrix. You're literally. And so, <laughs> exactly. Right, and so we're, and, and then we get to, how do I compare AWS to Azure? Okay. <laughs> and, and, and Alibaba and Google Cloud Platform, which have different options and a different permutation matrix in each cloud. So, um, and so the answer for us is to start off with kind of a synthetic general workload and get the lay of the land. Um, we could start out with, can I run Nginx, you know, a Cassandra database, um, you know, take a specific workload and try and test it. But honestly, the state of the art right now, uh, we're finding out things like if you load up an instance and run it for 24 hours, it doesn't have constant performance. Okay, there's a warm up period, then there's then it actually throttles, so to speak, um, and you end up with a steady state for a few hours, and then maybe after 24 hours or so, it might hit a different threshold, depending on what cloud you're in, what region you're in. Um, and so, what we're what go ahead. Do you think those are intentional throttles, right? I mean, because I could see, because I watch our own, our own cloud instance behavior like this. When we spin up a new system, it needs more CPU, it's downloading, it's installing, it's spinning things up. And then over time, 
they usually settle into a smaller limit and you could, I guess the providers could, could be tweaking these throttling settings or is this just a natural, I'm in a shared infrastructure. We're thing. going to have some opinions on that. We don't have enough data points on that okay. yet. And so what we, what we do have enough data for, and just to give you a size of the configuration space we're looking at, my summary. So uh, we have data science um, and data science hands me a, a <laughs> the Excel pivot table from hell. Um, and so it's a time series. It goes back to uh, March of, of 2019. Uh, right now we're collecting, uh, my summary increases by 16,500 rows per month. Each row is a unique configuration in a cloud region from one of those cloud providers. So it's a, it's a number of cores, uh, a processor, a number of cores, memory footprint in a region with a price and, and a production SLA. There are more that are not in production yet that you can order up and try out and all that. Uh, okay. So production, I'm, I'm seeing 16,000 per month. My, data, my time series data set is now over 200,000 rows. Um, it is a really nice pivot table. Um, I'll just put in, um, <laughs> so, and we, we use Tableau and some other tools on our backend database to do the really hard queries. Um, but uh, what we can do is we can rifle shot. Uh, right now we're testing that performance linearity with price. So price, price is actually perfectly linear, uh, is the way the clouds look at it. When they set the two, four, eight core pricing, it's very linear. When they set the, two, four, eight gigabyte pricing, that also is linear, different direction, okay? Um, pricing in different regions gets a little little odd, but um, that's just based on accessibility in those regions. And so we can, once we've done our testing on performance linearity um, for memory, for number of cores, for these different, you know, is it is it nitro, is it not nitro, you know, is it a catapult? or uh, one of the new instance types that I'll like, they have Dragon X as their smart Nick, right? Um, and so then we can settle down and start looking at these issues of long-term performance variability and throttling. So we're, we're right now rifle shotting which instance types and sizes we test uh, because we can then intelligently scale those once we have the scaling vectors identified. So we don't have to test 16,000 rows per month. That would be prohibitively expensive to go rent time on. Um, and so first order, first order of, of difficulty is just understanding the landscape and using some general proxy for performance, you know, raw CPU performance versus memory access versus IO performance. Um, and right now we're leaving, there's a fourth axis, which is network performance that we're going to leave on the table um, and take a look at later. Um, frankly, it's just too many variables to look at right now. Um, and, and, but there are substantial differences in all of those. So if, if you're not network bound, uh, will be our first set of performance analyses. Um, and that'll lead to at a price, you know, that, and, the cloud has already taken into account the uh, the number of cores, the memory profile, the networking speed. So at that price, is this value value comparable to some other value? And that will hopefully let us span clouds and span computer architectures, span microprocessor architectures. So like you would be able to identify, if, if you're saying that some of this stuff is very linear, yep. are, there, are there then, you know, sort of sweet spots in the in the architecture overall, like the, you know, if you can handle ARM architecture, like we were talking about earlier, then, you know, is there a, a price performance ratio for ARM that is just, you know, a, a different tier that, you know, so you would, you could do a blended, a blended infrastructure? Is so, that? yes, um, is the answer. Okay. And we're still, uh, we're going to dig into that next month. Um, we can see the M6G, uh, which is the is the new Graviton 2. It's been deployed for a couple of months. Uh, C6G and R6G join it um, at AWS this month. 
So uh, in early, or last week, they announced that they had deployed those instance types. And so one of the things we'll look at is, um, first is how they set their pricing. So currently, if I look at, and I've, I've got this just handy here. Um, so if I look at AMD's M5A, uh, M5AD, uh, which, which has SSD storage, and compare that to, um, so this is with AWS, M5A for AMD, Epic, Epic and this is first generation uh, Naples, okay, against Intel's M5, which is a Skylake generation. So they're roughly the same generation of processor, okay. Um, the difference is about 14% in price. AMD is priced about 14% lower than those in the, those comparably configured. So same, yeah, in this case, four gigabytes per core with two, four, eight cores. It's a very linear discount, okay? It's, it's just a 14% discount in all of those sizes. If I go to eight gigabytes, it's the same. If I go down to two gigabytes, um, actually they don't offer that for AMD, they do for Intel. Um, and there's a different set of <laughs> what's offered in which sizes. Um, yeah. Epic Gen 1, Skylake equivalent, is about 20% less performance, okay? Um, and so the question, the question we get asked of whether that discount takes into account that performance differential is for, for a couple of applications, yes, you can make up that difference. It is, it, there isn't such a performance drop. It's closer to Intel performance, but in terms of general purpose workloads, um, it's actually not as good a deal as you might think. It's less expensive for certain, but that, 14% discount doesn't make up for the fact that it is about a 20% left drop in perform performance that we're measuring. Okay. Yeah, that's fascinating. And so that's not wrong. Huh. Okay. That's, but, um, but as of the end of last month, as of the last day of May, when we do our scan, um, AWS doesn't have a Rome deployed yet. <laughs> It's all, it's, it's all Naples mm -hmm. in AWS. Um, Azure's got some Rome deployed. Um, and, and so does Google, um, but not AWS yet. So, you know, which generation of process, we, we see the processor, um, brand markings and for well over 90% of the, of the processors, uh, of the instance types and configurations, we see the exact model number of, of the configuration. So we could do pretty detailed comparisons on that score. I mean, are people optimized? I mean, I can see sort of the trade, the price trade-off comparison where you're, where they're saying it, or do you see people who are like, oh, I really have to be on Intel? The, I mean, I, I would, I would sort of expect the clouds to just swap it like, oh yeah, here's a, you know, ARM, you know, an AMD 64 processor, you know, type architecture, go to town. Why, so we're why? We're testing Google's E2 instance types because they do exactly that um, without telling you. <laughs> <laughs> so if you just like order one up, you can't see which one it is. They tell you that it's either an Intel or an AMD. It's fairly recent. It's at a discount to their other, you know, completely branded types, um, but they won't, they won't tell you. Um, and so, they're, they're actually taking that whole, you know, if you're just using, you know, a virtual machine set to a certain, you know, x86-64 profile, it'll run, right. okay? So don't worry whether it's AMD or Intel. Um, a lot of enterprise folks are still Intel brand centric. Um, the clouds are not so much, but they're playing to their enterprise customers as enterprises do this digital transformation mm -hmm. thing. Um, so, yeah, we, we see this in, the, that's the only case in the top four clouds where it's completely uh, randomized. There are other instance types, the low end of the, you know, the shallow end of the swimming pool, very small core counts, very small memory, where they don't tell you, it's unspecified. And so they'll arbitrage whatever is available and, and just substitute it. But you know, at the shallow end of the pool that, you know, you don't need much performance anyway. You just need it to run.
okay? And so those are unspecified. But for the vast majority of, of instances where you're asking for a certain memory profile a certain and a certain uh, core count, you're also asking for a specific processor. Um, and, th and they tell you exactly what you're getting. So is that... So no, that makes sense. Yeah. Although it would be, it's going to be interesting when the Rome information comes in. Um, <laughs> we're we're seeing pretty good performance there. We're not. I'm not ready to speak to that. Not enough data points yet. But um, Rome is good, and actually, Graviton Two is no slouch. Um, we're we're looking forward to being able to test more of those. Um, and so that, that gets us one whole set of, of configuration spaces. Um, so about 92, 93% of the market, um, is processor only. You're renting an instance type with a processor. The other seven or so, eight, seven, eight percent is got accelerators attached to it. So that's where you get an NVIDIA GPU, um, AMD is starting to pop up at Azure for virtual workstations, their MI series, MI25s. Um, saw a paper at, at ISC, somebody testing the performance of uh, MI50 in uh, high performance applications. So I'm looking forward to reading that. Um, but uh, for in, in the most part, um, NVIDIA rules accelerators. There are some Xilinx and Intel FPGAs. Um, they haven't moved very much. Um, haven't moved my, much at all. Um, and then there's yeah. AWS's Inferentia, which popped up a few months ago. So I, I saw on Intel, in fact, this week's Intel's uh, uh, supercomputer uh, thing, uh, they, they call there's FPFAs. <laughs> so is there any difference or is it just marketing it's branding um xilinx calls their new fpgas an a cap because uh, they <laughs> want to get away from it um and so essentially those are um where you integrate an fpga with a lot of other logic so right. you're you're putting some ai specific circuitry in there you're putting you know some uh better io better memory controllers, maybe a couple of ARM cores, not if you're Intel, but um, <laughs> yeah, you're, yeah, maybe a couple of Atom cores, um, but you, you're actually building a microprocessor, a, a complex multi-core microprocessor that has a lot of FPGA built into it. And right. so that's, that's what they're trying to do is build standalone parts um, that don't need a processor with them. Um, you haven't seen NVIDIA go that route yet? Um, they're perfectly happy to charge $15,000 for their top of the line GPUs in a data center. Um, I have not seen pricing on the A100 yet. They're recently announced. It's got to be like close to $20,000 per, per chip. <laughs> it's a great business to be in. Per chip? Yeah. Yes. That's well, their, their, v, their V100, previous generation Volta, is, is like $15,000, $16,000 per chip. So, so are the cloud providers building like a custom board with those chips wired into them as opposed to doing them as expansion boards? Is that what you're, you're implying here that these are specially built cloud infrastructure machines, not just not traditional GPU card type acceleration? Uh, some of them are doing PCI express cards. Okay. Uh, the challenge with the cards is that there's only so much power you can supply to a card. Okay. Right. Um, NVIDIA's reference architecture for cloud is called HGX, HGX2 now, um, and they're revving that for um, the A100s because it, it is, when you put eight of these things in a single server, um, that's a design that you want to get right, okay? Then you can bolt on whatever processor board you want. Um, and that's actually done with PCI Express moving to uh, PCI 4, right? PCI E4. Um, so um, having one, two, four processors attached to a complex of uh, 
NVLink connected NVIDIA, process, uh, NVIDIA GPUs um, is a really complex design. And so NVIDIA has commoditized that high-end design for clouds. Um, it's also really high power, okay? So we're talking about racks that maybe have four of these servers in it and operating at a, like 36 kilowatts per rack. Um, these are monster power consumers, okay? So, and so that's our, our next frontier, um, looking past benchmarking processors, is um, gonna be trying to tackle this whole inferencing question because now we're in the mainframes versus um, regular servers territory, but with GPUs. So what NVIDIA is saying is everybody's been working on these accelerators for inferencing. Inferentia is one of them. So they're small, cool chips. You have a whole fleet of them in, in maybe like 16 of them in a server. Uh, and they're designed to do transactional inferencing. So they're running a model on single images on a couple seconds of voice, right? On, so they're, they're doing very, very discrete tasks as a transaction. Um, training is completely different, right? Training is this big monolithic thing where you could use eight or 16 of these big GPUs all in the same memory space, burning tens of kilowatts of power. Uh, but, but in inferencing, we're looking at um, watts per transaction at a latency. So I need to get my latency down to human perceived levels. I don't need to do better than that. So if I'm recognizing an image, I need to return a result to somebody who's looking at that search or whatever they're doing with that image, return a result to them in, in under a second. And that sets my latency ceiling. I, if I do better than that, I don't get any credit, right? And so you're trying to just get the right amount of inferencing per watt because that's the cost of the transaction, okay? And what NVIDIA is saying on their new A100 series is that you want to look at this as a mainframe. So you're running IBM's Linux mainframe. And if you can keep it busy, if you can keep it 100% busy, you know, like that IBM mainframe running Linux, um, you can run containers on it all day very efficiently um, and with great reliability at a low cost per image. Okay, it assumes you're keeping the mainframe busy. And it's the same thing with these A100s is NVIDIA's got exactly the same story. And can we keep, if you can keep our A100 busy, it's going to be more efficient than buying a bespoke um, inferencing processor chip by, by going and writing your own FPGA code or like, like uh, AWS did, building your own inferential chip. And, and part of this message is aimed at the clouds themselves because they're all building inferencing chips. Uh, so Google built TPUs, um, and the TP1 is still in deployment um, doing some of their search algorithms. Um, TP1 is, is um, integer only. I say integer, it's mixed precision, right? But it's, it's an integer style um, ALU. Um, TPU 2 and 3 are floating point, and they've been having difficulty. Uh, right now, you can run TensorFlow on them or, or PyTorch. Uh, but they've been having difficulty attracting developers because uh, NVIDIA has done such a good job on GPU development. Um, and again, for training, but not really for inference. Um, but Alibaba's got their own chip. Uh, Microsoft doubled down on FPGAs. And, and so they've been, their attitude has been um, deep learning is still in such an early stage of development that we, we actually don't know what we want to standardize on to build our own ASIC chip, right? So we're going to stick with FPGAs. We think that's a little bit more efficient in terms of transactional efficiency, okay? Because the CapEx cost of these, the capital expense of buying the chip gets lost in the three or four years of operating the chip, right? So it's all about lowering the power per transaction for infancy. Um, so that's our, we, will, we, we are trying to figure out, you know, is it ML perf? Is it, you know, so what, what kind of tool set we would use to test inferencing in accelerators um, in the cloud? And that's, that's actually a tougher problem than general purpose 
uh, performance of a processor in the cloud. I'll stop there for a second. Any so, questions? Yeah, yeah, there was a question in the channel from Michael. You want to ask it? Mm. Serverless, great uh, question. Yeah, um, serverless. We, we have lambdas, as you know, in Amazon Lambda. Um, you yeah. basically have a sliding scale of CPU and memory. Um, and so you get more CPU, you get more memory. For example, we have a serverless app and we need to, the thing to come back in 15 milliseconds. So now the thing has two gigabytes of RAM to give me enough CPU to, to get back in 15 milliseconds. That's also on our radar um, to, because that's kind of the next question we get is, you know, is the world moving to serverless and how do we measure relative value of running running serverless code versus renting an IaaS instance. Um, we actually run a lot of serverless um, in, in our back end. Um, most of it is serverless. We had to back off, we hit some limits and, and uh, had to talk with our AWS salesperson who denied there were limits until the CTO guy in the room said, uh, that's not entirely true. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so the, for us, we've got to write some code that will run um, in serverless and figure out what the equivalent environment is in an IaaS. And because AWS did a great job of giving us Firecracker, we're, we're doing some work there of setting up our own lightweight VM. And, and that'll, after we get this whole IaaS landscape done, we will probably tackle the serverless question before we tackle accelerators um, because it, it is high value and um, frankly, it's probably easier <laughs> than handling the emergency question. Uh, but the answer is don't know yet. Um, serverless, what they charge customers, we're trying, one of the things we're gonna try and figure out is fully loaded, is that paying for the server in the same manner as IaaS? Or is it generating more income for the cloud? And um, I, don't have, I don't have an opinion on that yet. Um, I think you'll find that if you use something like Fargate, you're definitely paying more money. Right. And so, yeah, we, we have to, that's, part of this is just accessing serverless um, versus just the all in one cost of an of IaaS. I'm renting an instance type and, and so yeah, we gotta figure out what all goes in the price, but thanks, that's, a, that's good. I, along those lines, I mean, serverless to me is the ultimate micro compute thing. Is, do, you, do you see, I mean, uh, I'm assuming Amazon's not losing money on any of these transactions. Um, but I also assume that their profit margin is higher on some of them than others. Like, do you see um, Lambda's cost effective for the user at small transaction volumes, but how fast does this thing stack up? Just like the same thing, I guess if I bought four two gig machines, right. is that stack up better than a one eight gig machine? It's, you know, do you have a rule of thumb? We don't yet. Uh, not for serverless. We're working on that for for the exactly that whole. You know, if I've got a couple of two core machines, do I can I really get a better deal out of a four core machine, right? With the same memory per core footprint, um, because price price does scale perfectly. So theoretically, the overhead of running the instance type will get will get to be a smaller percentage of the performance. This is part of why they moved everything out into the nitro sidecar right? Uh, right and so does that performance overhead decline as you add more cores and it should so you should get a better deal um don't know where that performance point is yet on serverless i, I can't even make a guess but it's some it's one of the things we're we're going to probe into right um i had something in my mind that i was going to mention and it went away so <laughs> sorry um Oh yeah, serverless versus instance sizes. That's so. Yeah, actually, um, that would be fun to see. I can probably pull up. So what we did was um, we have a service that I just benchmarked and then got larger and larger instances uh, in serverless, right? Right. Cool. 
and um, uh, graph those all somewhere. I'm sure, I had it somewhere. Yeah. So, uh, you know, part of what we're trying to do is, um, and I, I should have mentioned this earlier. Um, you can see some of the information that we um, gather in, in a map that we have uh, publicly available on our website. So if you go to lifterinsights.com, uh, look for the regions map, uh, it's in the hamburger menu. Um, and that, that will give you a pull down where you can look at processors, processor brands and accelerator brands per uh, cloud region. So for, for our comparisons, we actually, um, and this is another, <laughs> one of those other permutation dimensions, is that sometimes the regions coincide in a city like London um, or Paris or, but in the US, we get these like West Coast region, East Coast, it's in Virginia somewhere, right? Um, and so we try, uh, we actually do a geographic roll up um, for, for pricing, for configuration availability and stuff. We, we call them clustered regions internally. But in order to actually compare like pricing for US West Coast, we've got to generalize pricing across the West Coast regions for Alibaba, Azure, Google, uh, and, and, and uh, Amazon. And so there are differences in pricing in the same country in the US. So there's differences in pricing between US East and West occasionally, between US, US West, US Central. Um, and then you go to same, same vendor, same, same cloud in, in Europe. And uh, there's pricing differences between Paris and Switzerland and Spain and where, you know, wherever. So we track where they light up new regions. Uh, we compare the pricing. So if you're in the South Africa region, um, which uh, AWS just started up there, Azure's been there a while. You know, what's the competition look like? How are they pricing in South Africa? Is, can you get an accelerator in South Africa? Um, same with South America. You know, what, what very limited availability of some of the uh, instance types and SKUs. What about India? <clears throat> and so <laughs> we're... Did they, did, they, did they do that, Michael? I'd love to see the chart in a second and let my question short. Do they do that pricing deltas to like discourage use, like to direct people away from a overloaded data center, do you think, or? Pricing, so on demand, talk pricing strategy for a second. On demand yeah. pricing, um, one of the one of the secrets that people don't clouds don't really talk about is that regional pricing for a production instance type over the lifetime of that instance type is likely not to change at all. Okay, okay. it just does. We after a year and a, a third full of data we can see that, that on average, uh, unless, unless a cloud is trying to rationalize the pricing of a region with another region, which has happened a couple of times, uh, the pricing in region for an instance type is invariant. Okay, the on demand. So now they have different performance commitment prices if you wanna sign up for a one or three year performance commit, reserved pricing, okay. They also have spot pricing. And spot pricing, we tried to actually track, have some stock market. I mean, we did a lot, a lot of AI <laughs> trying to do correlations um, in spot pricing versus anything else. And it's completely arbitrary. Spot pricing really has to do with the availability of resources in a region at, in that hour. Okay. okay. And, and so it, it's but not. Aren't there situations where a spot price can go above the instance price at yes. one point? Yes, there there have been a couple of those where the the where that region is overloaded. If you want to, if you want a you know, if you don't have a reserved commitment, um, then you have to go you go somewhere else or pay more. Okay, um, if you have to do something in region because of data requirements, data sovereignty, um, then you're stuck. Happens occasionally. Um, prices are higher in some regions because of the cost of maintaining that data center. So they do absolutely load those costs onto their local users. So if you're in the Swiss data center, if you're in the Paris data center, 
if you're in Cardiff outside of London um, or London itself, you're gonna, yeah, your pricing will vary based on location quite a bit. And, you're, and because of that, your value will change, right? Same performance, plus or minus, um, you know, the local networking environment, um, local local storage environment, but your your performance will vary a little bit. Your pricing may vary wildly for the same for the same stated configuration. Uh, so that's uh, what else we got. Uh, sorry, I'm laughing at my we're, we're we're actually very casual. Paul's just the superstar on the data on the data side. I <laughs> yeah, there's I'll, I'll tell a story about Paul if you don't mind for a second. Because he and I go to go to events together and we invariably are flying southwest <laughs> at the same time. We have about the same status, so we're we like end up like in the in the A in the A bumble something next to each other like oh you're going to whatever also um and i'll get to sit next to paul and he will spend two hours telling me about all the amazing things going on in cpus and performance and he's a unique unique person from that perspective um but yeah we're we uh we are getting towards the top of the the hour and so um next uh we i'm always looking for new hosts we have the next couple structured out and so um, we range on all sorts of topics from deep technical to, you know, how to make conferences better, which is whatever people want, whatever, just like lunch and learn, it's whatever the topic, topic on your mind is. Um, Paul, the, uh, boy, we've covered so much ground. Uh, can we jump back to the ARM question? Uh, sure, yeah. Because, I mean, here's, I, I mean, I've been, um, a fan, but not, and maybe an enthusiast, not a fan. I don't know, and fan, not an enthusiast um, of ARM. And it's like, yeah, this makes perfect sense. We should all be using ARM and it should be. And there's so many operational problems to make ARM work, right? We see this with the Pi stuff that we, we play with. It's like, oh, well, all that's going great, but you wanted to use this library that's not compiled for ARM. And so your whole tool chain broke or they don't pixie boot, so your whole tooth chain broke. You know, it's, it only takes one, so it doesn't, and then your whole tooth, tool chain breaks. Are we, saw, I mean, is, are we getting closer? Is that one, is that the problem? And then are we getting closer to that with like Apple and, and Amazon and other people like just pounding on ARM as a platform? So they have their server reference design Right, so there's a hardware reference design with a boot reference design. Um, all of their operating system and cloud customers encouraged ARM to promote that. It took them years to actually develop and, and get it moving. Um, the challenge now is demonstrating robustness. Um, so they've got the basic infrastructure to boot and manage, but now, in order to deploy at scale everywhere, um, your management costs, you can't, you can't be rebooting ARM servers because something threw them out. Um, and so the, the I mean, and so it's a, it's a real challenge for deploying ARM infrastructure. AWS is ahead of the game because they did internally deploy. So one point about cloud deployments, clouds, experiment internally with the latest stuff. I'm sure they've got Cascade Lake. I'm sure they've got, you know, Epic Roam internally deployed a little bit. But what we see is the stuff they really like goes to market in IaaS um, three or four or five months later. So if they're going to buy in volume, if, if they decide this is an architecture we can really use, um, they, do, they don't keep that like internal only as a super secret thing. Uh, because they're already buying it in volume. So that's their next generation of public IaaS services. And so we see the stuff that's really successful actually roll out as an IaaS service 
which is why we know that AWS was serious about ARM with Alexa. They have all data centers running, as we see now multiple ARM instance types, okay? M6G, C6G, right, um, R6G, and that's, that's how we'll know when Rome really takes off, when, when their AMD infrastructure is okay. stable. So the question isn't as much, you know, ARM specifically, AMD's had some of the same issues and it's an x86 instruction set. And so, you know, does it fit in with the management tools? Can they deploy it? Is it stable? Um, and so I think where we're headed with that, again, sci five, you know, when it happens, uh, we'll have a, a pretty fertile ground um, as long as they can demonstrate stability. Um, what we've seen, and this is a driver issue, is that with the exception of the AMD virtual desktops, AMD on AMD, running Windows, by the way, in Azure, um, nobody couples a, an accelerator of any type with an AMD processor. Same is true with ARM. You cannot get an ARM instance type with a GPU attached. Doesn't, doesn't happen yet. Okay, even in AWS's public cloud, they're not allowing you to tie Inferentia to an ARM instance type. Uh, question for you. Now, Packet is a lot smaller than these other guys, but Packet is very heavily into ARM. I would assume that their tool chain is probably a little bit uh, better and more robust, but um, also I know that in non-server ARM, there are some uh, GPU types. Uh, the Huawei chips all include NPUs on them. Right. Uh, but I don't know that if they've, if they've migrated to any data centers, I would think it would most likely be Alibaba's or Tencent's as opposed to here. We're looking closely at Tencent right now as to track them. Mm -hmm. uh, we track Alibaba, um, just like we track the other three. Um, yeah. And they don't offer that in their public cloud yet. Um, and, and so speaking directly to Huawei and their own internal inferencing chips um, and, and their own processors, right? They have their own Kirin processors and their own, right. I forgot what the name of their inferencing chip is, right? Uh, so data center, you know, enterprise data center, high performance clusters are different. Um, so NVIDIA, their new reference design for A100 uses AMD Epic processors because they're enemy and my enemy is my friend, then they're going up against Intel, okay, <laughs> long term. <laughs> and so they, instead of supporting Xeon in their new 16 GPU badass mm -hmm. 10U box, right, they've, they've got a couple of, of Epic ROM processors, right? Um, and so it, it's not that you can't get drivers and run these in your data center. Uh, and Packet is, a, is more expensive to support the variety that they do because that's their, that's their customer benefit is they have the variety. They're, they're going after the developer audience who wants to test against new processor architectures, okay? Um, in a cloud where I wanna support a cloud region or support multiple cloud regions and roll it out planet wide over time, I'm going to be buying hundreds of thousands of processors. And so it's got a different level of reliability benchmark to hit. Okay, right. the, the drivers have to be bulletproof to support all of those regions at scale over the course of the next four or five years. Um, and so that's the challenge is, is if, I'm, if I'm operating a data center and I, and I my, my development staff and I'm comfortable with getting an ARM processor and some Xilinx FPGAs and doing the work myself. I can get it. It's, it's you know, somebody will support it. Um, but, um, but that's not scale. That's, that's right. me taking the hit in my data center because that's what I think I need. Cool. All right. I hate to do it because I, I know we could go another hour, but we are at the top. So I'm going to, Bid everybody adieu for the week. Um, I yeah, am I a speaker I... for next week, so I will see you there. Sorry? I know I talk a lot. 
So uh, if you have any questions, let me know. <laughs> dropping jewels of wisdom, so I appreciate it. Uh, Thank just you. wanted to say, Paul, you probably know the guy, Alan Baum. He's working at uh, uh, something like Mill. They're, they're doing the uh, AI uh, Risk Five. I actually retirement. don't know Alan, so um, yeah, please ah. reach out afterwards. So thank you. I'm, I'm trying to be cautious. We had a Zoom bomber in uh, another webinar I hosted, and we promoted somebody. Oh, goodness. And uh, oh. then what was strange is that they managed, after they were promoted, they managed to have um, ele elevated rights. So I would demote them back into attendee, and then they... Um, they kept promoting themselves back to panelist. Huh. So. So no video on this one? Uh, you should have video. Hold I promote you to panelist now, you have it. There we go. And let's see. Hi. And everybody should be able to talk. All the background replacement. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this That's is, great. This is me. I have uh, my OBS. I can't fix my OBS without uh, ending my Zoom. Right. And I started them out of sequence. So I'm playing with a new. I'm playing with a new green screen. So you can actually. So there should be artifacts at the edges. Uh, not so much. Oh, it's because I tightened it up. Hold on. There you go. There's your artifact. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> oh, yep. Can I get in on some on the magic too? Uh, sure. Let me move you. Hold on. I've been exploring the limits of my micro four thirds camera. Nice. Ooh, nice, nice background. Yeah, this is I think just Zoom standard stuff. Uh, maybe not. Uh, I'm really sad my OBS lets me do video in the background, so. Right. You know, I have OBS installed. I need to go check that out. It's super easy. Yeah. Tom, did you want to do, oh wait, I got, oh, okay. Tom, I can throw you in video too if you want. Um, but I should say the interesting thing about HPE swag this year mm -hmm. is that it's so very subtle. It's just that rectangle. Good for them. All right. Yeah. Oh, that's nice. So actually the Yeti mug they sent me is it's like I thought, well, they just sent me a Yeti mug. Oh, it's got a rectangle on it. <laughs> All right, there's there's some uh let's see. Oh, and socks yeah, are so, still a thing. Go ahead. So are they sending, they're sending you virtual swag? Is that the idea? We got, we got a physical swag kit for their virtual event. Okay. That sounds like the way to do it. I'm, I'm bringing... <laughs> I had to go in the office to get it. Um, that, that was a little behind the times, but <laughs> it was fixable. <laughs> oh, damn. That's the way, that's the way things go. But yeah, I, I guess if, you know, if you get swag, you're more likely to attend the event. Is that the idea? I think so. I, I think that's the, uh, that is definitely the, the, it's something that ties you to an obligation, right? Mm -hmm. um, it, when they were doing the whole analyst influencer thing on site, it's like they, they have you there, you're trapped, you're in the keynote, there's, and there's not a lot of bandwidth there. So you know what you're doing for the next hour and a half to three hours and then there's the expo floor and all that stuff but right. it's a little bit harder to and plus there's like three events this week right so there's hp discover there's uh the international supercomputing conference which i really need to catch up on um and then there's um this little event i think apple is having um, oh, what? <laughs> some arm server thing i don't know yeah it's, i don't know it's, it's kind of a minor event <laughs> There are more than three. I just can't remember them all. It's like they're oh. all stacked on this week. Exactly. <laughs> well, we're used to bookending everything on the holidays, right? Everybody wants to travel that week before the holidays so they can then hang out. You know, some people hang out the whole week for the extra. 
Worth yeah, and here in Texas, we're looking for that curve to continue up after the 4th of July. <laughs> That's, uh, we we're, this isn't the second wave. We just kind of plateaued for a little while, and now it's continuing on up. Yeah. Yeah, Paul's, Paul's an, an Austin native with me, or an Austin. <laughs> So. Is Austin the part of Texas that's having such a bad time of it? Austin and Houston? Uh, so we have like four <laughs> cities in the top top 11 now. And, and when Austin oh. passes San Jose later this year, Texas will have four cities in the, in the U.S. top 10 uh, largest. So Houston, Dallas, San Antonio, and Austin. Oh. Well, San Jose uh, like just size. Okay. Yeah. San Jose is starting to creep up a little bit. Yeah. But... Uh, it's really all coming down from the LA, San Diego, Riverside, uh, uh, Imperial Valley side. Yeah. It's like we're yeah. but between we're between the big. Between, there's like a long time. Yeah, so there's five metro areas in um, in Texas that account for about 20 million of our 25 million population. I'll say this is a camera's optional event, so don't feel pressured to put on camera if you don't want to put on camera. <laughs> so. I sometimes have a low, uh, a slow connection here and it glitches, and if that starts happening, then I will just go on to audio, but it seems okay at the moment. That's cool. I, I originally started everything with um, a um, no, no video at all, but everybody seems to like it, so I'm not going to fight the fight the trend. The only time these days we get to see each other. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and, and some of the backgrounds are kind of interesting. Yeah, the although we can't read your bookshelf. <laughs> it's boring. It's a bunch of computer science, economics, <laughs> uh, marketing books. <laughs> <laughs> Get my. Uh, that, that's the big game on TV these days. Reading the uh, the talking heads bookshelves. <laughs> right. My mine is purposely out of focus. That way you can't see 1984 oh. and Das Kapital. <laughs> 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 Some of it's a little dystopian. <laughs> see, Are we currently in a dystopia? <laughs> Yeah, it's already. Yes. <laughs> there's, there's, there's my my actual window out my office. It's not what's behind me normally, but oh, fine. What's out my office? Oops, when okay. I when I get the OBS video working, I actually like my cat will get on the count on the windowsill and so, it's like <laughs> I like the, it just takes it takes me more set up. Oh. Yeah, but con oh, so con we were talking about the confluence of conferences and, and attending. Is there any anything major besides, you know, Apple going to ARM, HashiCorp's going to Europe, which I'm watching? Um, though the big thing at ISC was the number one ranked system this year, Japanese, is based on ARM. So folks at ARM are, I have the big confluence of stuff. I know they brought on a high performance computing expert about six months ago. And, um, and so that, that now has purpose behind it. <laughs> wow. uh, also, a lot of Amazon instances are going ARM. Yes, they are. We're tracking those. Um, I'll say something about that in a, in a few minutes. Um, we're, we're paying close attention to what Amazon's doing. Uh, with ARM and, and what the rest of them are doing with um, Epic, uh, AMD Epic, and um, well, there's Epic Gen uh, 2, which is, we call we classify as a V6 processor against um, Cascade Lake, right? So Intel's Cascade Lake against uh, Rome, against uh, Graviton 2, against whatever else is going to enter the market this year with, with ARM. <laughs> <laughs> you accidentally walked straight into Paul's uh, topic area. So. Uh, yeah. well, I was going to ask about Risk Five. Is there anything yet um, commercially out there that's worth looking at on the Risk Five side that we're going to hear about? 
Not for data center yet. Um, the place that'll show up first is, is believe it or not, media controllers. So um, SSDs um, and uh, hard disk drives uh, will use Risk Five as as WD and Seagate and and the um, other folks switch over, uh, so that they don't have to pay licensing fees on those extremely large volumes. So you know about the uh, the Risk AI. Uh, chip design company out there right now. Yep. Yep. Uh, and and Sci Five has got an outpost here in Austin as well. Um, yeah, Austin's if, a great place to live for data center to tech. Computer architect from that company, the AI one. I can hook you up. Oh, that I yes, would love to. Um, he, so yeah, he used to. He actually dragged. He was the guy, one of the guys who dragged Apple into ARM originally. Got it. So the, um, the Rockies. Rockies. I'd say that the one thing that's lacking, day. the one thing that lacks in data center for risk five right now is they haven't demonstrated that big 64 bit architecture yet. Although they right. we know they're working on it. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and then they're going to run into the same problem that arm ran into, um, because I've been tracking ARM and data centers. Uh, I don't know if anybody remember Calzada, another Austin startup. Um, <laughs> so that was a few years ago now, okay? That was like 2012. Um, and so it, it's, it takes a while to develop a mature software development ecosystem to enable a new architecture to go into a data center where it has to be deployed at scale and supported. And it's that and supported part that's really difficult. Um, and it's it's why we're starting to see AWS create its own ARM ecosystem. Okay. So they're developing PaaS services on ARM to support their IaaS instance types. So you can keep everything on ARM as you go forward, right? And it, it's that is all AWS doing the engineering and development work and, and the reliability work. So mm -hmm. Graviton and Inferentia were designed to support, this should be no surprise, Alexa. Okay, so those data centers that are serving Alexa are based on Graviton and Inferentia. But to deploy those in IaaS, they had to do a lot more work. And a lot of that was just you know, over the last couple of years, making sure that their Alexa, their own Alexa development environment and, and the robustness of that service hit a level to where they could deploy to IaaS with confidence. Okay. Yep. 